Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon to talk about regenerative agriculture from a slightly different perspective, thank you, that of the chef and consumer. So hopefully that's your customers and your future customers. My name is Lizzie Rivera, and I'm a sustainability journalist, and I'm also the founder of a website called Live Frankly that's doing its small part in helping to reframe this conversation. So today we are going to explore what it is about regenerative agriculture that's capturing the minds of a public that typically aren't too concerned with where their food comes from. We're going to focus on storytelling and ultimately we're answering the question, what is it about regenerative agriculture that's really resonating with people and how do we build upon this interest in an authentic way? Spoiler alert, that's not about focusing on the microbes in the soil or the carbon figures, important though that data obviously is. So joining us today, we have Thomasina Myers, cook, writer, presenter, and founder of the Oaxaca Restaurant Group. We've got Ed Aiton from organic delivery company Abel & Co, and he's also the chair of the B Corp Regenerative Agriculture Working Group. And last but not least, obviously, we have Peter Grieg from Piper's Farm, who I'm sure inspired many of you earlier today. And Piper's Farm has been going for 30 years now and supports 40, I believe, around 40 small-scale family farms. Um, so to get us started, we're going to hand over to each of the panelists just to give you a five-minute intro to them and their unique perspectives on this talk. Tommy, over Thank to you. Thank you trying not to get upstaged by a cow pat, desperately. Um, uh, so, five minute intro, and I was told to bring slides, so I've got slides and a five minute intro. So I'm gonna try and do this without talking too fast, which is gonna be a challenge. Um, so I started cooking when I was six. I was also wrong about the rainforest when I was six. And 40 years later, it looks like we've done nothing about chopping down the rainforest, which is fascinating. Um, in my 20s, I then became a VAT consultant, a marketeer, and an internet strategist before realizing that food was the only thing I could possibly do. So I did MasterChef, um, which started me off my career of food, uh, which was great. But before MasterChef, I was actually in Mexico. So I went to Mexico on, when I was 18, couldn't believe the food. And so I went back 10 years later to live in Mexico City. What I loved about Mexico was the food culture. Everyone ate well. Didn't matter how poor they were or how rich they were. Everyone cared about the food they ate. In fact, it was part of the community. And when we talk about community and food, this goes back thousands of years. The idea now in this country that food is unimportant, you know, discovering fire, sitting around a fire, breaking bread was the start of civilization. That's how villages and towns and cities started. It was community and food. Um, and, and that's what you get in Mexico. This is three generations of cooks who cook the most exquisite food, but using incredibly biodiverse products grown in their back garden. Um, so I set up Oaxaca. So back then, 2007, we had a lot to tell people because we knew this as Mexico, but most people thought this was Mexico. You know, Tex-Mex food, kind of naff, cheap, not very good, refried beans and lots of cheese. But of course, the Mexico I knew was a completely different story. Home to one of the, some of the most incredible indigenous crops, scores of varieties of corns, 200 varieties of um, chilies, cacao, tomatoes, beans, courgettes. Um, and in fact, when you talk about Mexico, you're talking about a mega biodiverse country. This is what a scientist from Kew told me at a food biodiversity summit I went to. 30,000 flowering plant species to the UK's 1,500. It is extraordinary. Uh, and in fact, going even further back, the way that they farm food is really fascinating. This is the milpa. So the milpa is a uh, system of bio, um, holistic farming where the, the corn grows up and then the climbing plants like the chilies and the tomatoes and the beans climb up the corn structure. Uh, the, corn, the courgette plants at the bottom provide kind of cover um, and prickly leaves to combat insects, um, also mulch, also to um, protect against fungus, and then of course the beans nitrogen fix. It's a perfect holistical um, farming system with no need for fertilizers or, or inputs, nitrogen inputs. One of the ways at Oaxaca we try and promote better food is half of our menu is vegetarian and the other half is telling people to eat better meat. Um, so we're a founding partner of the Sustainable Restaurant Association, and we've won numerous awards for our sustainability, and also have had made some great friends. That's Guy Riverford from Riverford Organic. Um, 
we co-chaired or co-set up the pig idea, which was about recycling food waste to livestock. Um, we believe in working with small-scale food producers. And why do we do that? That's Hodmodoz, who we're also working with, which is a great company in, in Norfolk and Suffolk, a cooperative of farmers growing great organic pulses in British farms. Um, so we do it for, you know, we, we talk about we're zero waste to landfill, we win all the awards, and we're carbon neutral. We became carbon neutral in 2015. We do this for our customers and also for our, um, for our consumers. Lizzie's about to stop me. But more personally, very quick 30 second, you know, what is regenerative farming for me? It's got to be a holistic look at farming. Uh, there is no point in separating out um, soil and food um, from different farming practices. This is what they did in Easter Island when they cut down too many trees and, and died out. They also did this in Palenque when they cut down all the trees and made big pyramids, which kind of doing some of the things with HS2, don't get me started on that. But, um, you know, how can we, with the biggest elephant in the room as well as climate change is soil erosion. So there's got to be a mixed use farming where we're not only regenerating soil but also producing food. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, okay. Um, so my slide will pop up now. And actually, Lizzie, you didn't introduce my slide, and, and it's sitting on a chair in the prime spot. So um, here, but seriously, uh, Thomasina, that was really inspiring. Golly, I think that was only five minutes, and you covered so much ground, but it is real because you are at the sharp end of taking cash off consumers and really walking the talk. I would try and, and just say, I suppose that's what Piper's Farm set out to do. Henry and I started 32 years ago, but we, a bit like your inspiration in Mexico, we believe the resource of smaller scale family farms was incredibly valuable and at the rate it was going, they were all going to have gone by the time people realized how incredibly valuable they are. So our definition really of regenerative is the way we speak to our family farms is simply say to the younger generation, if you want to come home, if you remember what your granddad told you when you were sitting on his knee, about how you farmed that particular bit of landscape that your family had been guardians of, possibly for generations. If you remember what he tells you, do it. We're not gonna throw a big rule book at you because every farm is different. Every set of resources in farming is so different, it is impossible to say one size fits all. And what you were describing, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Mexico, 30,000 different species, and in this country, 1,500. It's the same, really, probably with farmers. And the smaller scale farming businesses are the best way to adapt to the incredible diversity of resource in terms of soil type, in terms of um, aspect, location, all of that. So, Briefly, to define it, I guess, we see a really exciting future in a regenerative world. Because it's now digitalized, we can stack enterprises into landscape. So the new land use is going to be a rich tapestry of a whole mix of different skill sets. A lot of it is back to the future the blacksmiths, the, the woolen processors or the wool processors, the um, craftsmen, the woodsmen, all of that, they all have a place in a future regenerative landscape. And at the heart of it is the basic principles of how we produce food that delivers nutrients and health. Health is going to be huge and we see a, f a future of many, many smaller scale businesses delivering food that consumers recognize as being vitally important to their own health.
Uh, now that's being upstaged by Calpat. <laughs> okay, I don't think more. Ah, oh, there we go. Here we go. So yeah, as you can see, my name's Ed. Um, and I am in that picture trying to convince my partner that my foraging skills are both safe and effective. Um, the fact that I'm here to testify to that is itself testament to that fact. So I work for the organic delivery company Abel & Cole as their sustainability and communications officer. Um, what does that mean? Basically, I means, it means that I bridge the gap between uh, the good stuff that we do and the marketing, the good and the bad. Um, I also have the great delight of chairing up the B Corp's working group on Regen Ag. I tend to find regenerative agriculture as a term that I have to take a run up to, so I abbreviate it to Regen Ag, if that's okay. Um, if you're not aware of what the B Corp is, it's a third party verification for companies that believe that they reach the highest standards of social and environmental performance. So if that's something that you assume about your company, then B Corp will soon validate or contradict those assumptions. Um, it's actually a really exciting space to be in because I head up a group of, uh, there are 18 uh, logos on that, uh, that page there, but there are about 20 of us now. Um, and the analogy that I always draw is, it's a bit like a room of people shouting speech, speech, speech at each other for about 10 minutes before everyone realizes that we don't actually have anyone to make the speech. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite an interesting uh, space to be in because obviously as the group has grown, we have taken on more thought leaders in the field, otherwise known as farmers. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so it's a really interesting space to be in and basically the, the point of the group is to try and explore Regen Ag, to try and incorporate these, uh, these practices into our supply chains and, me and to explore what it means to our customers as well. So what does Regen Ag mean to me? Um, well, here we go. So my interpretation of Regen Ag is an approach to farming. Note I haven't said system. Approach to farming that doesn't just sustain but repairs and improves the resources, ecosystem services and communities that it uses and reaches. These ecosystem services include biodiversity, soil health, water quality and carbon sequestration to name just a few. For me, it's, uh, it's a, an opportunity for collaboration. Um, it's a holistic and inclusive approach. I say holistic because I've included the word communities there. It is as much about society and the benefits for, for in terms of social development as it is for the environment. Um, and it is a journey. It's not just a tick box. When I say journey, it's constant improvement. It's not a tick box that you can just say, yep, yeah, done, resting on my laurels until the next certification round. So, um, so it's very much, uh, yeah, very much all of the above. But I think that word inclusivity is something that I'm going to come back to time and time again today. Brilliant. Thank you all. <laughs> need the bulk to bark. We don't need that. Thank you. Thank you, though. Cool. So I actually think that's a really nice point to finish on, Ed, which is what Regina Ag means to you. Uh, and I think we're all here kind of with, with a like, we're all quite like-minded on this subject. And I've been to a lot of talks today which are about bringing the government on board to help the policy changes. Um, and we're assuming that the consumer's on board as well. I mean, there's definitely more being written about this in the mainstream press. Um, and when you're going to restaurants, people are talking to you about it. Abel and Cole, Piper's Farm, you're booming, hopefully, still. Especially were during COVID. So, what is it about Regen Ag that's appealing to the consumer from, from your point of view? You guys have access to the customer. Uh, yeah, well, cool. I'll jump in there. Um, so I think the biggest appeal for Regen Ag is probably in the name itself. Um, you know, we have to ask, do our, do our consumers kind of really care? Well, yes, I like to think that they do. Um, I think that there is an inherent draw in a type of farming that if the name is anything to go by is, um, you know, it repairs and regenerates, it doesn't just sustain. So, um, so yeah, so if we're asking, does, you know, does the consumer care? Yes, yes they do. We have the, the cohort of dark greens um, who, who, they're the ones who have already made the link between the product that they're purchasing and the, the impact, the social and environmental impact. Um, I think that there is uh, obviously 
Um, you know, if you, if you were to list kind of some of the benefits of regen ag, so increased biodiversity, increased soil health, carbon sequestration, animal welfare, I think if you were to approach any one person in the street, uh, any random person in the street, then you'll probably find something on that list that they will care about to, to a significant degree. Um, the bigger question is, do they care enough to draw a significant enough link between these issues and the food on their plate to change their behavior? And I think that this is where a lot of, uh, a lot of different factors kind of come into play. So obviously cost is, you know, is a big one. Um, there's obviously a lot of kind of misinformation around, uh, you know, kind of contemporary issues. Um, there's a lot of conflicting information. Nefarious interests have very quickly realized that they only need to plant the seed of reasonable doubt to kind of overcome boycotts and get people buying their products again. I think that there is also the context of time too. So, you know, if we were asking this question two years ago, I think we'd be having a very different conversation. Um, the fact that organic has seen such a huge sustained uplift over the last year is not just a reflection that people want to, you know, kind of start looking after their own health, but they want to start, um, you know, looking after the health of the planet. So I think that we are kind of seeing a lot of issues come to the fore, such as, uh, you know, look at the profile of palm oil in the public domain, for example. So we're seeing quite massive um, kind of uplift in, in contacts about deforestation, for example. So I think that, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that kind of come into play. And obviously, then you've got compassion fatigue as well. You know, a lot of people can quite rightly say, well, I, I, I care about enough. Um, we actually commissioned some research a little while ago that looks at the, uh, the importance of issues that a, sustainable, that a sustainable brand should be looking at. What, you know, how important do we rank these issues in terms of kind of the consumer's mindset? And it was really interesting to see that environmental health and animal welfare actually did much better than just organic. And we found it interesting because we, 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 we thought, well, our consumers just know that you know, organic might, might be able to kind of cover all of the above. Um, so, so yeah, consumers kind of, they do care. Do they care to a point that they will always make the right decision no matter what the cost? I don't really think we're there yet. Um, but this is where consumer facing brands such as Abel and Cole really you know, have to kind of come into their own. We have to get to know our audience. We have to do the segmentation work. We have to know what makes each individual customer tick and bridge the gap between what our producers are doing and what our customers um, require and uh, you know, kind of balance that with, with what's um, you know, important socially and environmentally. Brilliant. Pete? Uh, I think um, the fact of the matter is about 70% of what we as a food business do every day is deliver convenience. And although we've been on this 32-year journey, to enable our customers to understand more about how their food is produced, there are two things that are absolutely essential requirements. First of all, when they stick our food in their mouth, they've got to go, wow. And I guess, and I normally would pick my audience very carefully, so apologies if I've got this wrong, but we are unashamedly in the orgasm business. Our job as food producers is to give people pleasure. Number one, if they eat something and they think bloody hell and they remember it, they will come back and buy it again. The obvious thing as farmers is the way to produce food that is absolutely fabulous to eat is to revert to good old-fashioned systems of farming in harmony with nature. But that fabulous sensation has got to be accessible, and that's why digitalizing the landscape is so exciting, because suddenly all those nice sensations from smaller-scale farmers who work with nature to produce amazing food, it's accessible. And those consumers do not have to rely on big corporations as the vehicle to bring their food to them with it all sorts of unbelievably complicated messages. So last thing I would say is that three days ago, we had 
a group of young students from South Devon College. Henry's working with FFCC, and part of the, the work strand is this idea of education. Those kids came to the farm to work in a veg garden. We've, we've offered up an acre of our farm to a young family to grow veg. It's awesome what they're doing. So these six kids came to help Abby plant seeds. It was pouring with rain, so then we took them up the farm to move the bullocks. We're mob grazing the bullocks. So we moved the bullocks and then got down in the rain on their hands and knees and looked for dung beetles in the cow pats. And then I grabbed a lump of wool and I said, this wool, rub it on your face because it's amazing. Rub it on your hands, rub it on your shoes. This is real. And if you buy man-made clothing, every time you put it through the washing machine, you put plastic into the ocean. And these kids, they were drenched. All of them are excluded from school because the education system can't cope with their free thinking, I guess. But that's the point. That is the future marketplace for all of us. We've got to start with that generation. It's hard to change their parents, I guess. But we must bring them on and then tell the stories. Make stuff accessible and tell real stories to customers. They love real. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, talk about nail on the head, telling the stories and making it accessible. So we set up a charity two years, three years ago now called Chefs and Schools. We take one chef, put him in a school kitchen. He, he trains his entire kitchen team. They then produce incredible food that they feed to 600 children or maybe 1,000 children, depending on the size of the school. They transform the way 600 or 1,000 children eat. This is by one person's act. Um, and, and, and it's cheaper food. The food is cheaper because it's not processed, it's not industrialized. They eat um, vegetarian food three times a week, meat once a week, um, and fish once a week. It's better quality food and it's cheaper. Um, we have to be able to feed people on low incomes better food. Um, the fact that 52% of the chopping basket in the UK is ultra-processed is scandalous. And I think people are beginning to make that link. In March, the um, Worldwide Obesity Foundation put out a global um, report showing the absolute correlation between COVID deaths and obesity rates in countries across the world. There's a causal link, 90,000 people in this country die every year of diet-related disease. People are beginning to realize that the food they eat can either be good for them or bad. And it's not about the fancy packaging, it's about the core ingredients and the soil that they're grown in. And I think if the farmers can begin to tell those stories Tell this because people want to know. People are so confused by the different media messages and they just want to do the right thing by them and their family. If they're poor, they want to be able to afford it and that has to be a government thing that they take on board. Um, but they, they, I, I think people are desperate to do the right thing by their health. And, but, but it's got to be inspirational too. And as we, you know, in Oaxaca, half our menu is vegetarian and half of our sales, more importantly, are vegetarian because those vegetarian dishes are delicious. And food has got to be about delicious. You can't bash people over the head and go, thou shalt not eat, or thou shalt not do this. Or You've got to say, come on, guys, this is delicious. Let's cook it. And, and that's about education. But it's also about telling the stories. And are people choosing those, are people having those discussions with your servers about the vegetarian dishes? Or is it just, those are the options on the menu, and that's what, the, that's what they're choosing? Well, I think increasingly people eat more vegetables, but I think even, you know, the government's so behind. So at the moment, we're about to put all sort of food labeling in our restaurants, which is going to be a national decree. And it's all about calories. But, you know, calories, I've got a bean to start on my menu at the moment. It's got Hodma Dodds beans in. It's full of fiber. It's delicious. And it's got fat in it, too. And all they care about is the calories. It's probably got a bit of guacamole on it, too. So that is a completely nutritious kind of bomb of flavor and nutrition. And yet, it'll probably do badly on a new... But what about fiber? We know that fiber is much more connected to good gut health and proper all-round health. And yet, that's nowhere in, in the health. So when is the... Is anyone from government here? I mean, it's about education, but even the government need educating on this stuff. They do. So do we think that... I mean, when you're talking to farmers, it's, it's a lot about biodiversity. When we're talking with the public, is health the way to go with this, with, with getting people on board? All three of you have mentioned it at some point. That's a, that's a question to all of you. I think, I think farmers need help, and the governments have got to be behind this in rewarding farmers, not only for the good stuff they're doing to their soil, 
but the good thing they're doing it in terms of nutrition for food they're producing. Because we all know that food grown in good soil has got more nutrition in it. But so there's got to be some way of measuring that so that the farmer can produce food and charge more for it. Because we do need to pay more for better food. Because it's not only better for people's health, which saves billions on the, on the NHS side, but it's much better for soil health, which saves billions down the line in what we're able to produce anyway. I think we, it's big deal, isn't it? It's been spoken about quite a lot today, this idea of how does, does government, how does the centre tell a nation what to do? It's a real big problem, isn't it? Because those kids I was talking about earlier, they don't conform. But they need to be able to break out and have a life where they learn. They get stuff wrong, they make mistakes, they take risks, but they learn lessons. And I feel, as a food and farming industry, we need to just share real and exciting and irresistible with our customers and let them just make their own decisions and that way stop saying, I've got to be told by somebody what I'm allowed to eat or what I'm not allowed to eat. That dish you've just described sounds absolutely gorgeous. And it's like the bottle of milk I, I had earlier that's produced by Sam from his Jersey cows and there's a layer of cream on the top like that. That is seriously good food and how anybody could really seriously be thinking, well, of course, I shouldn't eat that because it's got too many calories in it. That food is going to connect with the gut biome of anybody who drinks it. And the biota are going to say, wow, thanks. And that person's going to feel great. So it's got to be experiential. We somehow have got to rely on people breaking the shackles of being told you do this. And I am a huge optimist, and I think it's going to happen because we had a shop for 23 years in Exeter, and so physically, we'd see 600 customers a week come through the door. Those people definitely did not have lots of money, but they were smart enough to think, how do I get value for money? They might only spend five quid a week and buy a chicken carcass, but they were smart enough to go home and feed their family on what they could afford to buy that was real. That wave of demand is just going to grow and grow and grow, and they'll leave behind the bloody rules about what is supposed to be good for them that has been dictated, it's been defined by the big corporations, like you said earlier, they make money out of ultra-processing rubbish, we just have to believe in a real world where we're going to have human beings making choices that aren't difficult when it comes to it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 agree, I agree with all of the above, and I think people are wising up to the fact that cheap food is a false economy. Um, but going back to the health point, when I first uh, kind of broke into this, this, this organic scene, I didn't really know what the word meant at the time, but I very quickly realized that actually the bar that products need to pass to call themselves healthy is actually quite high. So when people are looking at nutritional claims on organic food and realizing that actually the, 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 the research is not robust enough for us to make these claims yet, and people were coming to me and they were doing a quick Google search and they were saying, oh, but if the, if, if, if the pesticides have worn off by the time the fruit gets to me and that's not an issue for me, and if there aren't as many omega-3s to pass the bar as people say there is. What's the benefit in it for me? And I thought I was quite smart at the time and had this retort, which was, it's not always about you. Um, and I thought, oh, yeah, look at me, clever milk, clever old me with that dry retort, but uh, it didn't do me any favors. But actually, there's nothing wrong with telling people, you know, you are allowed to look after yourself with these things. Um, but it, it, I am noticing amongst our consumer base that people are starting to balance the, the requirement for you know, their own health with that of the future generations. Yeah, I think, I, th I think this question of nutrition is really important. I, um, I tried to write an article on it a couple of years ago, and there's just not the data around yet. So if anyone has that here, I'd be super interested to hear that. And I, I do think it will help to, to tell the story properly. Um, so other food movements that are really big at the moment, I mean, Ed, you work in organic. Um, Peter, we've got veganism, and obviously you're a meat-based business predominantly. And then we've got carbon neutral and net zero, 
with Oaxaca and what you're working on there. Whoever wants to go first, how does Regen Ag work, work it in the bigger picture? Cool, I'll take up the mantle there. Um, so between, between us, between you all and I, I actually struggled to get the approval to attend this panel talk at first because there was a concern what me siding with anything but organic might look like. And it was a legitimate concern. I am effectively you know, the ambassador for an organic food company. Um, but it, it, in the end, wasn't a particularly difficult case to make because uh, my first question was, how long have you got? The second point was that they are, they, they do require different approaches. So if you think of it as asking different questions, so organic will ask, what did or didn't you use to make this product? Regen Ag will ask, what did you put back in the process? So for me, it, it, I think what, what muddied the waters somewhat was what happened over in the US where the term regenerative was thrust upon the no-till movement, often at the expense of other people being able to use it. Um, I think over in the UK, we've, the consumer has kind of slightly resisted that somewhat, um, and the movement has itself. So we've managed to maintain this kind of sense of you know, holistic, uh, this holistic approach, this kind of sense of inclusivity. Um, I think where they complement each other, um, so obviously organic kind of offers you know, a label, it's a recognizable benchmark for the consumer to say, okay, I can be fairly sure these guys aren't cutting corners. It offers the farmers a marketplace to, to, to get a premium for their product. Um, where does it compete? I, 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 don't th I don't necessarily think it needs to, I don't think, you know, I think the last thing we need is more competition. Let's face it, we need to start collaborating. But I think that regenerative agriculture, um, I can say it quite clearly now, I'm up on stage, weirdly enough. Um, I think that uh, it's kind of, it, it is accelerating the need for organic to, to evolve and to stay relevant. And it's an interesting question to ask, why after years of campaigning, years of explaining to the consumer what organic means, why is, why is it still not a key expectation of the consumer? How has Regen Ag managed to so effortlessly float into the room and capture people's attention? And it's going back to what I said earlier, I think the clue is, is in the name. Um, I think that or, organic, um, it's, you know, it's quite, it does need explaining, but regenerative says everything that you need to know. So even though, um, you know, even though the consumer might not recognize the potential for regenerative to, to mitigate climate change or to increase biodiversity or to improve soil health, I think there is that, like I said earlier, that inherent draw in a in the way that a project in the way that a product has been made um, that repairs and regenerates if the name is anything to go by Fab. I feel quite strongly that a label will never ever sell food um, labels taste dreadful no matter how you cook them and there there's lots of fiber but nothing else um, the point is that the supply chains need to be shortened. Customers love stories, as I was saying earlier. They want to know who has produced that food. I mean, um, where Thomasine is talking about the, the chef going into a school kitchen, and it's transformative. One person is real and cooking differently, and suddenly there's a whole school of kids who think, wow, Meal times are exciting. Food consumers want to know where their food has come from. They want to know for definite, and therefore the supply chain wants to be short enough, and in a way it's back to the future. The high streets of individual shops, the butchers, where the customer would look the butcher in the eye, and in the old days the abattoir was probably behind the shop and that butcher would know the farmer he'd got the bullock from. That's a very short functional supply chain, and it's honest, it's got absolute integrity. It doesn't need regulating, because if the product's no good, the customer goes somewhere else. But there needs to be a, a totally restructured um, supply chain system. So we want functional, local, and regional supply chains, and that includes the abattoirs, 
That includes the feed mills. It includes the whole system of local functionality. And, you know, I think that is the way Regen Ag is going to find a massively growing and exciting market opportunity. Personally, I'm not a great believer that labels in and of themselves don't actually deliver much satisfaction. Okay, fair point. Tommy? Daphne, don't think you can cook them to make them taste very good. Um, yeah, I think, um, I think, I th I, it's an interesting one. Uh, you know, there's a there's a big rise in veganism. Uh, I think young people eating less meat is great. I love the activism involved in it. Yeah. But I think it's problematic to, in terms of regenerative farming, the, the role that cattle can play. I mean, Andy Cato was here talking about um, world farm grain and the experiments they've been doing and how vital cattle are actually for building structure back into soil and nutrients back into soil. You know, it's pivotal. Uh, and I think... We ignore the wisdom of our, of our ancients with peril. Y you know, there's an arrogance to mankind that they can rip everything we've been doing up for th you know, thousands of years and think with some technology they can just you know, reinvent the wheel. Yes, technology is a great force for good in that it can help us with, with ancient farming techniques to work out how to get the most out of regenerative farming, how to get the best out of this holistic. And it's a great movement. Um, but there's got to, I also feel there's just got to be some taxation. I mean, the ultra-processed food I was talking about isn't even in the NHS's language yet, but, and yet it's got a very perfect definition, which you can Google. It's something to do with more than five ingredient, man-made ingredients to formulate a foodstuff, which is basically made out of commodity crops, soy, flour, or corn, and they have no nutritional benefit. Now, listen, we can all eat crisps and, and junk food and donuts, and believe me, kettle chips is like my guilty pleasure. But the point is we all eat good food as well. If you're bringing up whole nations of people who only eat that food, how is that good? How is that good for, I mean, I've talked about the NHS budget. So um, I think stories for the consumer, helping them to kind of weave through all those mixed messaging, which, which big industry is good at telling us what is healthy, when actually it does go back to the very simple stuff of, you know, eat mainly plants, lots of them, less meat that is better, and great diversity of diet. And those messages maybe aren't sexy, but they're pure and they're good. So, so how do we make them sexy? What, how do you compete with the mixed messaging of big business and the huge marketing budgets? And for all of you, actually. Uh, we shout loudly, don't we, Peter? I mean, <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think we can make it all delicious. And I think that's what it's about. I mean, I've just, I'm just writing a book. I mean, I'm a food writer. In fact, I forgot to say there's a book tent over there. I'll be signing books after this. Um, my book I'm writing at the moment is Vegetarian Mexican. And it's great because the ancient Mexican diet is mainly plant, a little bit of meat, and, and great diversity. And so it's been great fun uh, writing essentially an ancient cuisine in a modern way. We can make food delicious. I'm sure Peter's producing masses of really delicious food that I will want to eat. It's got to be about shouting to the consumer, tempting them, you know, with delicious food, but, but good food, and, and, and helping the farmer weave the story because people love a story. And, and this thing about accessibility, they've got to be able to get hold of it. It's got to be accessible. I mean, look at how your industry, Tommy, in terms of hospitality, pivoted around home delivery. People want convenience, yeah. and, and the fact that they just ordered meals straight from the restaurants was um, indicative of, of how that is part of their fast-moving life. I mean, they bought a lot more... Uh, raw ingredients from us during the first lockdown, but then they start. The restaurant started thinking, "Well, hang on, we'll just deliver the meals to them." So I just think we, as an industry, need to make real food out of real communities accessible, and the digital world makes that so achievable. Yeah, and, I, and I'm quite socialist about this. Ch Jamie Oliver's part of a new charity, and it's led by young people, and it's led by young people living in the cities, and they only have access to chicken shops, and, and it's all bad food, but the community centres have been um, you know, stripped out away from the communities. They've got nowhere even to go after school. Mm -hmm. So off school in the winter, they either go home to their, and these are teenagers, 
go home to their flats, tiny flats, and hang out with their younger brothers and sisters, or they hang out together, the only place they can hang out together is in the fried chicken shop, because that is the only safe space they can actually be. And then they end up buying the fried chicken. So with this Chefs and Schools charity we're doing, which has been hugely successful, we've been in 50 schools over three years, way more than we ever wanted. And if you want to get involved, or you know, it's a brilliant, brilliant charity. But you know, what if we ch change every primary school so those school kitchens also cook for the community in the evenings? We've got to think more creatively about how to bring everyone on this food journey, because it's so important, because we know that that ultra-processed food that is killing us is also killing the planet. And unless we address both those things, we're never going to get anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, what's that? There's an amazing food project in East London, Patrick's Holden's daughter, growing communities, where I just imagine kids after school, instead of going into the local chicken shop or, or just to the park, go and get in amongst growing communities, get involved with food production. And it's so exciting, and they do it. They've got the app on the phone, say, oh, you know, where can I go and plant some seeds or harvest some food, and bang, there it is, and off they go. It's, it's cool. And, and also, the reality is that in 2050, that, you know, 80% of our, the world population will be living in cities, but that doesn't mean you can't make sustainable cities. And the Ellen MacArthur Foundation doing a lot of work in how we can make cities more sustainable. And I just think, you know, the good producers and the good farmers got to keep making their way and opening up those doors because they are the heroes. You know, we heard a lot about the NHS. Obviously, we're heroes in COVID. But also, what about the, you guys? You know, the food producers. Yeah, we need a doctor maybe once a year, if we're lucky. We need a farmer three times a day, for sure. I mean, of course. Um, so one of my questions was going to be, but I do think that you guys have started to answer this. How do we make sure that we're not preaching to the converted? How do we make sure that this movement does expand beyond those of us who are already on board with the message? But so go ahead. OK, slightly left field. I believe, I was going to say, I believe the most commonly used word in every doctor's surgery within the next five years will be gut biome or microbiome. I.e., hopefully, doctors will start just saying, you're in here feeling rubbish. You could feel a bloody sight better if you start to think really carefully. I then, this is the left field bit, um, was thinking every doctor's surgery could have a cow pat in the doorway. <laughs> and so it was a constant reminder. We just get the message out there. But fundamentally, the way people feel, if they feel shit every day and somebody said, you could feel a lot better, that's powerful. Yeah, it is. It absolutely is. So I also think climate change is the most uh, terrifying head in the sand inducing paranoia feeling thing that you can possibly give to a person. You know, the world is collapsing. We are losing three tennis football pitches every second of good soil. And it's getting worse. And we're still chopping down the rainforest. And everyone thinks, shit. But conversely, three times a day, every single one of us gets to make better food choices. And that is powerful. I've been feeling very optimistic today, um, listening to all these talks, and you just brought me straight back down <laughs> for a moment. Um, and sticking with the negativity for a second, because what everyone is saying here is optimistic, and it is wonderful, and it's very possible. Very possible, I do believe that. But how do we stop big business co-opting Regenag for marketing purposes um, when it's not really, when they're, when they're not practicing it, they're just using it as, a, as an appealing label, which I can see happening already. Um, yeah, how, how do we maintain the integrity of Regen Ag if we don't go down the certification route? I don't really want to discuss whether certification's key or not. I want to, how do we keep the purity of the message? You so I'm, I'm a big fan of accreditation, but um, there is consensus within our working group that farmers are under enough pressure. So I don't think we necessarily need to go down the route of an extra accreditation. I think we might need to look at the certifications that are already out there and see how fit they are for purpose. So um, things like the PFLA, things like Global Gap, for example, which was put on my radar recently. How do we keep its integrity? Collaboration is absolutely key. Collaboration and balance, maintaining that sense of inclusivity. I said I'd come back to the I word quite often. Um, I think that the fact that it's managed to resist, I think that, that regen, regenerative has already been um, kind of co-opted by, by, uh, by many businesses. 
um, you know, in a somewhat nefarious fashion. But I think that if we maintain that grassroots approach, if we maintain that holistic approach, um, and you know, keep coming together like this to amalgamate support for each other, then I think we're, you know, we're going to resist the 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 big corpse quite quite easily. I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the only way to resist big corporations is from the bottom up. And I think as individual farmers, we've been picked off over the last 30, 40, 50 years by the input salesman coming to the farm gate and saying, you know, you've got to have this gadget or this spray or whatever, whatever. And I think that there needs to be collaboration, like you're saying. Collaboration, you talked about Hodmodods earlier. That is such a great company, ingenious with... Um, bringing together lots of individual farmers, growing pulses as part of a really fantastic regenerative farming system, and then bringing it to the high street. So lots of multiple producers bringing a product into the high street and marketing it really, really well. So collaboration amongst farmers. But the other thing is I feel so excited Earlier on today, after I'd spoken, there were several people came up, and they were all from non-farming backgrounds, and they want to get involved. And that's exciting, because you know we're great at what we do, farmers, but it is so cool if other skill sets come into the space. We want to stack enterprises in land management. We want to have all these different businesses, all these different skill sets. We want to have the psychologists, the people who realize the value of natural space in terms of delivering the outcomes they want for their patients. Bring all of that mix of skill into the rural uh, community, and we are going to generate much more power from the bottom up. We'll then just start to push back against big, big corporate power. But don't, don't you think there's some need I mean, if the government is going to get behind the farmers, which they should do, um, they will need to measure what the farmers are doing in order to, to pay them to do the right thing. So if there is some sort of system where they can measure farmers for doing the right thing, then surely it's not that much of more of a step to produce accreditation system, which is also consumer-facing. So the, the farmer does one thing, they get a reward for it, and they also get a tick on it, which means the consumer knows that it's good food, producing good soil, so better for them, and so they're prepared to pay a little bit more for them. That that's essentially is a label, but isn't that a good all-round way that farmers can get their subsidies from the government, but also get the extra income from the consumer? I think there's an inherent danger in a one-size-fits-all system like a label you know, sometimes presents, and we started up um, our own responsible supplier program to uh, not only to kind of rank our suppliers in terms of social and environmental performance, but to offer a benchmark for them to work towards. And you know, if they're kind of falling down on any of those areas, then we can jump in and provide technical assistance. But straight away, we noticed that we were missing out a lot of the detail. And you know, considering we're working with suppliers at oppo opposite ends of the country in different countries. Each one of those farmers we have chosen to work with because they are doing what they know works best in their particular situation. And I think taking a granular approach to that, I think you're just going to end up picking off the lowest hanging fruit and missing a lot of the virtue in what those farmers are doing in their particular situation. Yeah, I, I think it, it's dangerous to get governments to be responsible for ownership of the scheme. I mean, I think you're completely right. The whole Elms um, interaction between taxpayers' money and farmers has got to be completely overhauled. And from what Tim Benton was saying this morning, there are enormous pressures from within the policy-making community for go for this sustainable intensification, which sounds awfully like just an open door for big corporates to take over the space again. And I, I think there is a danger that big corporates can use labels to their own ends. They, they're very, very good 
at maneuvering around that. So I, I think we do need to somehow, okay, the Elms government intervention ha has got to, you know, it's a thing. But I just think our enterprise, it's entrepreneurship from the bottom up, which is the surest way. And Tommy, you know that better than anybody. We're developing Oaxaca. When you, the things you've got control of within a business, you think, okay, I know that is reliable. It's resilient. I, I, you know, it's got integrity. Stuff you're relying on somebody else to do for you. Are they, yeah, I, I mean, all lots of food for thought there just in that final section. But I do think there is something in what you said, Tommy, because even though, Peter, for example, you have integrity, how does a consumer really know that? And if we're looking for another certification, then it's, it's almost like you're penalizing someone for doing the right th thing. Whereas if we are changing policy, if we're changing subsidies, and there's a way to also communicate to that, that to the consumer, and perhaps it is because it's measuring a specific output that, that's really important, like biodiversity or like carbon capture, then there could be something there. It's tricky, isn't it? Because as Peter says, you can imagine as the government is forming this labeling scheme, big business coming mm -hmm. in going, oh, I've got a good idea, let's do it this way, you know, and, and it entirely benefiting themselves. Mm -hmm. And then also, as you say, on what level do you do it? Do it on biodiversity or your soil health or, or the food you produce or the community you're supporting? It's a tricky one. But, the, but, I think, but I think it is tricky that the consumer doesn't know. The consumer does not know when they're... Except that if, you know, I know that I go to my market on a Sunday and I kind of know where that food comes from and I kind of instinctively know it's good food. But what about the people who go to the supermarket? I, I, it's difficult. You can't overestimate what people know. I mean, and, and I say this as someone who was born and bred in London, who started writing about food sustainability seven years ago, and thanks to the kindness and generosity of time for, from people like Peter, I got to learn a lot more, but I'm also very entrenched in a London system and with family and friends who genuinely are not connecting the dots at all in this way. So. So we absolutely need to work on, on, on how to communicate that to them in a way that is not co-opted by big business, which, which is the struggle. That brings me back to the feedback that you had for Live Frankly, which was uh, someone said, yeah, it's great. It's for urban folk who have realized that their food actually has an impact. <laughs> and following on from that, I don't think you can underestimate the power of a good story. When we started the working group, we were searching around for a working definition and quickly realized, actually, to maintain that sense of inclusivity, we need to take a step back from that, keep it fluid, um, and illustrate Regen Ag and its benefits through stories and letting people decide what does our heart tell them. Yeah. Brilliant. I've realized that we are literally bang on five. So one final thought from each of you. What is the takeaway? What is the story that we're telling? Tommy. Inspire people to eat better. Inspire people to eat better. Take it outside the echo chamber. Yes. How, Peter, how? <laughs> uh, I, I, the thought that came into my mind is the, the doctor who said she got off the treadmill when she realized she was a pharmaceutical vending machine. I think the farming industry is a chemical, whatever, vending machine. And punters don't want that. So we've got to start with education and with health. And it, you know, it's basic messaging. We've got to believe in ourselves and go for it. Brilliant. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you.